All right. I hope everyone is having a really good evening tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the MIT Executive MBA Technology Industry Panel. Um, very excited to meet you. Uh, my name is Sarah Massey. I will be giving a program over you and, and talking to you throughout the evening. And I'm joined by two colleagues, Mike McCauley and Tom Little. You'll hear from both of them today. Uh, on the q and if, uh, if you type questions into the Q&A as we're going, you'll hear answers from both of us and, um, and you'll hear a program overview from, from Mike as we go. Tom is handling all of the tech. Thanks, Tom. All right, so I'm going to begin with an introduction to the EMBA, give you all just a base level of background. Then we'll talk about technology resources at MIT, and Mike will give you some of the specifics that are in, of interest to people in the tech industry and technology as it corresponds with the executive MBA. And then we're going to dive into really the meat of tonight, which is your questions for our student and alumni panel. And we're joined tonight by, by three, two alumni and one current student in the program. And so they can really talk about their personal experiences. So let's get started. As an introduction to the EMBA, I really like to talk about our mission first. MIT is a mission-driven organization. You'll hear all of us talk about this. So if this isn't your first event, it's not the first time you're hearing about our mission. And I guarantee you all of the students that are on here tonight have this memorized as well. The mission of MIT Sloan is to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and generate ideas that advance management practice. And this is really important an important mission and the EMBA program, the executive MBA plays a really critical piece towards this mission because our students uh, are in a really unique position of being able to put into practice the mission in a daily, in a daily basis as soon as they go back into the workplace from the class. All right, a little bit about the program. This is a 20 month experience. So it's about two academic years over 26 weekends on campus. Those are uh, those weekends that I talk about are Friday and Saturday, every two to three weeks. So think of that as once or twice a month, you'll be coming to campus for these, day, for these two days. In addition, there are four week long modules that are interdisciplinary and really immersive on campus where you'll be here for a week and really immerse yourself in uh, campus and in the Cambridge and the Cambridge ecosystem. And finally, there's an opportunity for an international week-long project where you'll really get your hands dirty working with an organization. Uh, the, the destinations will, will come as they may depending on the project that you choose, um, but this is really a chance to get out into the real world and, and try some um, and put some work into practice with, with your classmates and really put your learning into practice in a different setting outside of your own organization. Really importantly, uh, sorry, Tom, I did pause there for a second, but really importantly, I should make sure that you know, this is an MBA degree. It's the same degree that you'll be earning if you are getting your traditional two-year MBA. And it's the same, and you're getting a degree from MIT. So there is homework. It's about 15 to 20 hours of homework on average per, uh, per week. And you're earning your degree here. It is quite rigorous. All right. Now, if you are thinking about joining this program, I know one of the first questions that a lot of people ask me uh, relate revolve around how they fit into the cohort. And so here are is a breakdown of our class, just at a really high level using some numbers. And these all come from the class of 2024, but it's fairly consistent year to year over the years of the program. And so this is what you can expect in the classroom with you if you're applying now for the class of 2026. We have 126 global executives, 86% of whom are at the director level or above, with an average age of 41 and 17 years of work experience. 33% of our, of our class are women. And in fact, actually this year it was 38%. Uh, so for women in the room, that number is going up. 66% or the majority of the class are non-local, meaning that they do not live in Massachusetts and they're traveling from out of state every time uh, for each of the class weekends and each of the modules. 
53% are of international origin, uh, meaning regardless of where they live now, they were born outside of the US. This is pretty similar to statistics across MIT faculty too, which I think is, is quite interesting. 17% of our students identify with a group that is underrepresented in higher education in the United States. And 63% six, are holding another advanced degree already. Um, this might be anywhere from a PhD to another master's degree, lawyers, doctors, et cetera. The one, that, the one statistic that all of our students have in common is that they're employed full time. It is a requirement of the program because so much of our curriculum is really designed around that hands-on learning that you have in the workplace in between the class weekends. All right, you are going to be learning a lot from our faculty. We have some of the top faculty at MIT Sloan. They're really world-class researchers. They are experts. They're excited to learn from you too, right? These distinguished teachers are choosing the executive MBA program uh, because of the quality of our cohort as well. I'm gonna talk just about really, really quickly about two uh, that, I'll, that I'll highlight. So one is Georgia Paracas. Georgia is uh, an Associate Dean of Social and Ethical Responsibilities of Computing. She's at MIT's new Schwartzman College of Computing. She sits there as well as her seat in the Sloan School. Georgia has been faculty chair of our program in past, in past years. She teaches EMBA courses like data models and decisions. In your second semester, you all, you'll all essentially go through Georgia's data boot camp. Um, and I think that's a really formative class for a lot of uh, a lot of our students. What her research focuses on optimization, uh, quantitative models, dynamic pricing. Um, so she has really interesting real world examples to bring to bring to the plate. And especially now in the with the current, uh, you know, with current advances in computing and what's going on right now in the world, really interesting. Um, viewpoint into, into topics of, of ethic and social responsibilities. We also, uh, you'll also learn from Demetrius Bertsimis. He is Associate Dean uh, for the Masters of ba Business Analytics program at MIT Sloan. He has a PhD from MIT. He teaches optimization, machine learning, applied profitability. Um, and then he also teaches for EMBA students, the Analytics Edge course, which some of our students call uh, DMD on steroids. So this is that next level course that our EMBA students can take in their second year if they really wanna go deep into, into prescriptive analytics. Mike, I'd love it if you jump in and talk to a little bit more broadly about MIT technology resources. Absolutely, thanks a lot, Sarah. Welcome again, everyone. We're really glad you're here with us tonight on the East Coast, wherever else you may be uh, dialing in from around the country, around the world. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about MIT's focus on technology, specifically within, within our own ecosystem on the EMBA and the Kendall Square ecosystem in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So as you probably may guess, MIT is the preeminent leader in innovation and technology, and that's really part of everything that we do, both at the Institute and at MIT Sloan, uh, quite literally. You see a rough map here of all the technology organizations, startups, firms, and businesses around Kendall Square, and specifically right in the middle of MIT, which is depicted in red on that map. Now, some of these companies were formed out of MIT, while others have a significant research, uh, significant tie-ins to research that were formulated from inside of our halls. And, you know, I, I think this map gives you an, an idea of just how many tech firms, too, in, in energy, biotech, pharma, VC, and data that truly are within walking distance of our campus. But let's talk about MIT and MIT Sloan ecosystem specifically. So we find that the ecosystem is set up in a way to truly support all the dynamic cutting edge research that's happening both inside and outside of campus. And now each of these focus on a different discipline too. And you can really see that intersection between technology and innovation and business at MIT Sloan. And each of these centers support research that is vital to today's world, focusing on the impact needed to do the hard work that solves big problems. And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in solving the big problems, right? And when we talk about ecosystem at MIT and MIT, so MIT Sloan, I do like to point out 
um, and give a reminder that if you are an MIT EMBA student, you can gain access to almost any of these offices and centers, can take part in the same opportunities as any other student here as an institute. MIT executive MBA students are MIT students. And that means places like the Center for Information Systems Research, which focuses on IT and workflow processes, and the Martin Trust Center for Entrepreneurship, which is a crucial resource for students interested in scaling their startups. Each of these resources are is such an important part of the MIT Sloan ecosystem when it comes to technology. Now, compared to some of these other centers and initiatives, the MIT Quest for Intelligence is still somewhat of one of the newer offerings here. So it was formed in 2018 and it's focused on two key questions. The first, how does human intelligence work in terms of engineering? And second, how can we better grasp that intelligence to build more useful machines that would benefit society? And the focus here, though, is on MIT's ethical responsibilities. Remember, MIT Sloan is a mission-driven school dedicated to developing principled, innovative leaders. It's what Sarah said earlier, and it's something that really we feel uh, really resonates with our students' alumni. And in, in initiatives such as the MIT Quest for Intelligence really does just that. It focuses on addressing the ethical implications of this work. We mentioned the MIT Schwarzman College of Computing, and I, I wanted to share maybe just a little bit more information about that here. So it's an interdisciplinary hub that strives to recalibrate MIT to bring the power of computing and AI to all fields of study and truly build upon MIT's strength in computer science. So to give maybe just a bit more context into that dedication to data and ethics, I'll share that obviously, uh, uh, maybe not obviously, but our former executive MBA faculty director, Georgia Prakas, who Sarah mentioned earlier, is now the Associate Dean of Social and Ethical Responsibilities of, Comput of Computing and has a leadership role at the school. And Sarah spoke a little bit about Georgia earlier this evening. And even with this new role, she's still teaching in the EMBA. And you'll often see those types of aha connections and cross-function collaborations throughout MIT Sloan. Um, that's certainly something our, uh, our panel, of st uh, our student alumni panel will speak a little bit more about um, later this evening. And last but not least, here are some examples of where our students in technology are working while in the MIT EMBA program. You'll notice too that 29% of the MIT EMBA class of 2024 is working in software and tech. And that's that number is pretty consistent across our cohorts. This is maybe one of the larger percentages that we've seen, but it is typically in the 18 to 30% range. Um, and you know, some of these organizations you can obviously see are within biotech and pharma, others in innovation and science. There are large organizations, startups, some local, others on the other side of the country as well. And there's a vast amount of history in the organizational backgrounds in which our students work. And that's truly on display inside of our classroom. So Sarah and I have been talking a little bit about the MIT Executive MBA to you. Uh, we really want to spend the rest of this session hearing from our students and alumni. So before I do pass it over to Sarah to moderate our panel and introduce uh, our student and alumni, uh, I do want to give a plug. If you do have any, any questions, this is now the time to enter those into the Q&A chat. And we'll be answering those live as well as um, in chat, but also with our students and alumni. So Sarah, back to you. Good. Thanks, Mike. All right, this is really the, the fun part. I think the most interesting part for any of you joining us from uh, from a, uh, live tonight. We have two alumni and one current student joining us. So I'm going to just go left to right and, and have each one of you introduce yourselves, Rachel, Daniel, and then Ryan. Um, the kickoff question really, just as, as an introduction, we've got the card up here with your name and, and your title where you work right now. Um, but as a brief introduction, could you tell everybody where what what were you doing when before you joined the program? So what were you up to before you joined the program, and what were your goals for this degree or this experience for yourself? And Rachel, I'm going to ask you to kick it off. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, super excited to join you all tonight, and uh, very excited to share more about the EMBA program, but also just about MIT more broadly. Um, my name is Rachel. I graduated from the EMBA program in 2022. Um, I also have a master's in mechanical engineering from MIT. 
um, many years ago. Um, and so I have uh, a fantastic experience and an incredible love uh, for this institution. Um, institution isn't even the right word to describe um, the magical place that MIT is. Um, so what was I doing before? Um, so when I applied to the program, I was about six months in to a role at Microsoft. Um, I had been recruited into Xbox, to Microsoft devices, uh, to lead the next generation Xbox console program. Uh, it was called Project Scarlet. Um, and it was the next generation consoles. Um, they were about 18 months out from launch. Um, they were off track, they were off schedule, they were off budget. Um, and we did not know what we did not know, which is we were a few months away from a global pandemic. Um, and so I joined the EMBA program intentionally while I was in the midst of probably um, one of the wildest and most rewarding and most challenging um, career opportunities I had while at Microsoft. Um, because I really wanted the same experience I had from MIT 20 years prior to that moment. Um, MIT changed the way I view the world. Um, I'm originally from South Carolina. And so coming from South Carolina up to MIT um, changed my view of the world in ways you would think are obvious, but it really changed my perspective of what we could accomplish together. Um, I've always had these crazy wild dreams about building and creating and solving massive problems. Um, and MIT taught me that together with a great group of humans, um, we literally can do anything. And so while I'm sitting in this very big job with an incredible group of humans, um, I knew that I could use that again. I knew that that energy, that advocacy, that education, that view of the world um, would help me um, immensely in my current role um, that I was in at Xbox, but also would prepare me for a future um, that I didn't even know was coming. So um, that's a little bit vague, but it is, uh, it is everything you want it to be if you lean into it. And so um, that's kind of my background. Great introduction, Rachel. Daniel, good luck following. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, everybody. Just super excited to be here with you all and excited for your journey of discovering MIT and your application process. Um, I hope it's okay with everybody that um, my co-founder, CEO, Mick Oppie, and classmate has crashed the party. He's hanging out with us too. I do want to talk about him and, and our company together, Neural Payments, here in a minute. But to answer Sarah's question, uh, what brought me to apply to MIT. Um, I was a co-founder of another company in Nashville, Tennessee, and we had uh, closed a Series A and we're growing really fast and just hiring like crazy. And uh, it was this bizarre time. And one of my co-founders had done an MBA, I think at Georgetown. And he was like, Daniel, and I, at the time, okay, I was the CTO and about a, little, uh, about a third of the company reported to me and, uh, you know, I came from software engineering and I'd spent a career writing code. And now, like, I, you know, I had managers working for me and that was cool. But then I had like directors reporting to me. So like managers of managers reporting to me. And it's like, wow, this is really different. <laughs> and he was like, you know what you ought to do? You ought to go get an MBA. And he's like, don't go to like a local school or something like that. You need to go to like, you know, someplace like MIT. And I was like, out of my mouth, I was like, wow, John, that's a great idea. And in my brain, I was like, that's the craziest idea there's no way. Uh, but I, you know what? It's just like that idea stuck. And so I, I did what you all are doing right now. I like attended these, these webinars and I looked at the, the material and kind of read about it. And I was like, this is awesome. Uh, and, and so my desire to be here was I was an engineer who needed skills that I did not learn that, that were not that I didn't learn to be an engineer, right? I needed managerial skills and people leadership skills and financial management skills and all the things that uh, I felt like I could come and learn at MIT. Thanks, Daniel. That's awesome. I do. I remember the first time you visited us. And Ryan, uh, tell us a little bit about what you were doing before you joined the program and, and what you were looking for. All right. Thanks, Sarah. And excited to be talking to you all this evening. So I'm Ryan, Director of Global Solution Architecture at Workday. Um, I am the 
California guy, so I can give you a perspective of how it is to to travel in from coast to coast every couple of weeks or so. But um, for me, the reason why I ended up going back to to school was because I had moved into leadership at Workday uh, maybe about 2018, and I was moving up the ranks extremely fast. Um, and I was asked to make uh, decisions that were impacting people's lives in ways that I never really um, had thought of prior. And I wanted to make sure that I was very, very well equipped to be able to make those decisions because I think we're in a time where um, the world needs great leaders right now more than ever. So that's part of the reason why I ended up deciding to go back to school. And my organization, the organization I ended up taking over was going through a lot of turmoil. So I, I had a lot of managers and um, senior managers who were reporting into me that had five to six managers over a two year span, right? So the organization didn't have a sense of direction and um, they were asking me to put together strategies for our sales organization, for our product organization. And I wanted to make sure I was doing right by the um, by the company and uh, preparing myself to be able to make those right decisions. Um, but the other thing that had always been on my mind as well is, you know, I aspire to be like Rachel and Daniel, right? So when I was looking into um, schools, I wanted to see, okay, what is going to prepare me for bringing my organization into a successful, sustainable place, but then at the same time, what's going to help me with what I want to do longer term, right, with entrepreneurship. So um, for me, as I started looking into schools and looking at, um, you know, what some of the alumni like Rachel and Daniel are doing, I said, oh my gosh, this is a no brainer. MIT is not only going to help me now for what I'm faced with with my organization, someone moving up fast and needs to make decisions that are going to impact people's lives, but it's also going to help me in the next phase of my career, which um, is entrepreneurship. So um, that's um, why MIT for me, um, and I'm happy to, to answer any other questions you have about my, my current experience there. Ryan, thanks. That's great. And I see people are starting to see the q and have, You know, especially as you were thinking about getting an an MBA or an, or an EMBA, I know there's a reputation in the tech industry that there that there isn't value in an, in an MBA um, or that, that it might not be necessary for an employer. And I wonder if any of you thought about that. I know, Rachel, we talked really briefly about that. Um, but, you know, did you find that that was that that reputation is true? And if so, then, you know, why did you go for it anyway? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. And I, I'm sure Daniel and Ryan have um, equal experiences with this topic. Um, I think it's a very personal topic, by the way. Um, and in fact, a very personal decision. Uh, so Microsoft traditionally um, has not been super supportive of um, not just MBAs, but supporting MBAs. Um, and that's my experience and, and having talked to other people, I'm sure there are other, other experiences of the company. Um, however, when I decided to go back to MIT, um, I got really great advice um, from my skip and um, she is a Harvard MBA. Um, and so uh, her, her piece of great advice um, for this was, do the MBA for yourself, don't do it for Microsoft. And that goes a bit, Ryan, to your comments as well. Um, uh, we are not our companies. Um, even when we co-found and, and, and run companies, we are not just our companies. We are individual humans. And when you look at that mission statement, you know, Sarah said that you probably will see that over and over again. Um, the reason you'll see it over and over again is because it's true. Um, we are all individual humans. And when I think about what an MBA, specifically an MIT MBA, can do for me and my skill set and the growth that I want to have and really the future that I want to create for myself, um, that's the reason to choose it. Um, and I would give this advice to anybody with any kind of career question, um, especially nowadays. Um, I think obviously that's coming from a place of privilege where I feel grateful to be even, you know, having the conversation of should I do an MBA or should I take this career decision? Um, so I'm very aware of that. However, I also think there is this awesome responsibility that comes with that privilege. Um, and, and the MIT MBA um, exemplifies that, right? And so it's a very personal individual decision. Um, so I think it does vary, not just from tech to other industries, but even from teams, 
right? And so for me, you know, many lessons in my career um, beyond Microsoft even, I think, you know, you have to have your own set of core principles and what guides you. And so I would really look deep at that. That's really good. Thanks, Rachel. You know, Ryan, I know you're still a current student and one of our one of our attendees tonight is asking about the amount of work that it takes in between the class weekends. You know, how many hours do you spend on on homework and, and all of the things that fall between the weeks? I know we give the average of 15 to 20 hours a week. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what it's like for you in between class weekends? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, and Sarah is correct. Right? I'd say for me, um, it is anywhere between 12 to 20 hours a week, right? If you're, um, if you really want to get the most out of it. So, um, there's a lot of reading that's involved, but the reading is great, right? It really helps you develop. It's great. Um, assignments are definitely tough, but they actually have meaning, right? And a lot of the assignments you can apply. And honestly, a lot of the assignments do apply to your current job. Um, so, you know, that's what I, I, I'll, I'll say is that there is work that you have to do and it's not a, it's not a walk in the park by any means. And, um, I, I wouldn't want a program that would give me a walk in the park, but, um, what I absolutely love about the work is that I can apply, I'd say probably 75% of it to my job. And a lot of the times, you know, you are, in a sense, kind of required to look at a problem within your organization and solve it and give feedback on, you know, how it actually went. So while there is a lot of work involved, they do a really great job of aligning that with your current responsibilities at work. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks, Ryan. No um, I'm going to throw questions out and I'm going to let, you know, whoever feels moved to answer first, jump in. So don't be too shy with each other. I'll call on people if I need to. Um, <laughs> there's a, one thing that we get asked a lot is how are you putting this into practice? And you all have alluded to this a little bit, but I wonder if there's an example that stands out, either something that you've done recently or something during the program where you made a different decision or approached a problem differently because of, uh, because of a framework or something that you learned in class. Yeah, I can uh, I can give an example. Yeah, since I'm the the the, the current student, um, there's a class called organizational processes. It's the the class you're going to take in your first semester, um, and I think that one has created a tremendous impact uh, for me and my organization at the same time. So uh, I'll give you just a little bit of of context. As I uh, mentioned earlier, my organization was going through a lot of turmoil, um, and they were asking me to come up with a different strategy for how it is that we push the organization forward. But at the same time, um, I had a lot of um, people that were not on my side with the story, with the strategy that I was proposing, um, even though it was very well thought through. Um, being able to use some of the concepts within organizational processes helped me navigate the different politics within my organization and really map out how it is that I go about implementing a strategy and convincing people that my strategy is the right strategy to put forward. Um, I was able to do that, and it's led for me to grow my team by about 25% this past fiscal year. Um, and then also at the same time, a, a pretty good um, pay increase at the same time. So that's um, an example where as soon as you get in that first course, um, economics and organizational processes, you'll be able to apply it. But that's one example. I'll, I'll say another one is when I had to tell my manager um, earlier this summer that he was not making the right decision. Right. So he was looking at expanding out and creating a new team. Um, and it, you know, there wasn't a clear strategy around it. He didn't think about how it is that the teams would communicate. And it was a team that was in um, uh, the Czech Republic. And um, I remember describing some of the details and why it wouldn't work. Um, and ultimately, he actually ended up going with it anyways. And now we're in this position where he's saying, like, Ryan, how do I correct this? <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't think of, uh, I didn't really um, take into account some of the things that you were saying before. Can you help me through this? So, uh, one to help my organization when I was able to drive things through, but then also to be able to make sure that even though he didn't take the advice, but giving out sound advice and really knowing um, how it is to work through these. And I learned that through uh, leading organizations, which you will take in the your first summer semester. 
really helpful context. Thanks. Thanks. I'll jump in or on a piece of that one too. Uh, <clears throat> so our company, Neural Payments, was born in a class, right? So Mick had an idea uh, from his experience in the financial services world, and he brought it to our Idea Week class. Idea Week, yeah, Idea Week class. Uh, and then you, you kind of, you. Uh, what happened was his idea didn't get shot down like a stupid idea, right? And so then he like spent the rest of his time at MIT taking this idea to all of our different professors and like whatever the final paper was about, he somehow jimmied it to make it about the idea, right? And then he he just kept not getting told he's stupid over and over again. <laughs> and uh, hey, I mean that turned into a company, right? And so. And, and we're off the ground and we have 20 employees and paying customers and all of the things. And uh, this all happened here, right here. Daniel, that and and Mick, that reminds me of two, two questions I see in the chat. One's sort of about coming from a more engineering technology space and getting this exposure into, into finance. What are some moments that stand out? During your time at MIT, of the of the relationship between those different um, those different frameworks or, or backgrounds, and then also how did you juggle a startup with on top of the homework? Uh, finance, yeah. So, but that was one of the I guess going back to the first question, like one of my things. Boy, I should have said this at the beginning. One of my the, those reasons to come here is like in my first startup, uh, I felt like I could sit in the boardroom and and hear what the the CFO was saying and I could kind of follow along with what he was talking about sort of and if I was going to ask a question it was more of a question of like hey Lynn can you help me understand what you're saying right and I would I would like like this sort of just you know what that's sort of embarrassing like I would rather be able to sit in a boardroom and ask the CFO a question like well hey man did you think of this or did you think of that right um so that was absolutely a skill I was very interested in gaining while I was here. Uh, one of the few Bs I got was in our finance class because the final was super hard, uh, but whatever, I still learned a lot, right? Uh, Adam, I do see your question about balancing uh, startup life. I will, the thing, part of the thing that enabled me to jump on board with Mick was we, I exited my startup. We had a nice successful exit while I was a student here. so. Actually, a couple of us did. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and and that, that gave us an opportunity to jump in and help this guy. That's great. Super. Thank you. Rachel. Sarah, I'm happy to jump in on the finance engineering. Um, this was a huge moment for me, actually. Um, and one of the things that, that I was seeking at MIT that I got the first time and definitely got the second time even more so are these surprise moments. Um, where either complex systems or thoughts or learnings or these big macro concepts collide. Um, and this is very common. I'm sure Brian, Daniel, and you all have felt this. Um, it happens during the program. It happens when you go back to your job the next day. It happens years later. Um, I was literally talking to a colleague this morning who was in the program with me and she was telling me about this thing that happened a couple of weeks ago. It is almost like a surreal experience where you have these like aha moments of like, I just saw something. I, I don't know why I saw this, but I just saw it. And you realize it's because of the EMBA program and the learnings and the way that it is very intentionally designed. The program, I'm sure Sarah and, and Mike and the team can like really elaborate on this, but the program is the most thoughtful MBA you will find in the world. It is very intentionally designed to create a space where you can have these moments and it happens and it is like the magic I talk about. And so one of those for me, um, you, you have core classes and then you have some electives. Um, and one of the reasons I went back to the program during the pandemic, so I chose to do the program knowing we were full, full, full in a pandemic. I actually did not apply until May of 20. So like we're all out pandemic at this point. Um, I chose that very specifically because I'm a deep believer that in moments of crises like that, if you have these leadership skills, um, you can lead through it. And I feel very, very strongly that while the worst of us can come out during a crisis like a global pandemic, um, the best of us will come out too. Um, 
And I want to be in that group. <laughs> I want to be in the group that helps the best of us come out. Um, and so I'm in there and I'm listening and, you know, I've had my palms up like, hey, I, I really want to see this. I want to see one of these lightning moments. Um, and so my last semester, I took an elective by Roberto Rigobon, who, if you have not met him and you uh, have a reason to take this program, just research him. He will be a reason to take this program. He is one of the most amazing humans I have ever encountered in this life. And I chose to take an elective by him because I would probably take any course he ever offered. Um, he's incredible. And so I'm sitting in this global macroeconomics too, which like, I'm like all my background, you know, training and education is engineering. So all this finance economic stuff was like, you know, foreign to me, except the practical part of it I had, but I wanted to combine the theory and the practice maybe in the reverse order. Um, and so sitting in this class, and I had been struggling a little bit with, um, yes, I am in a position where I am making products and leading a global program, delivering tons and tons of products for people all over the world. We launched the consoles in 42 countries and holiday of 20, the most successful consumer launch in Microsoft's history. Super proud, like really, really proud. Literally was sitting in a hotel room in Cambridge on the day of launch and watched the consoles turn on in Australia a feeling I will never forget. Um, I still get chills thinking about it. And at the same time, I wanted to do more. Um, I felt a very, very strong pull towards something even greater. Um, I believe I've been really lucky in my life. Um, I, the older I get, the more I realize that. And I feel a very huge responsibility to leave this world better than I came into it. Um, and I came into it pretty great. And so having the opportunity to go to MIT um, is a responsibility for me um, to be able to give that back. It very much aligns to MIT's mantra, men's and honest, mind and hand. Um, and so sitting in this Roberto Rigobon class, uh, I'm struggling a little bit, like, where am I gonna go next? What am I gonna do? Do I take this all back to Microsoft? You know, what does this mean for me and my future? How do I lean in here? And I had an epiphany. Um, something I had felt in my career, whether it was at Microsoft or running my own company or working for a governor in a Southern state or working for a nonprofit. Um, I realized that I can't go from mind to hand. I cannot think of things and invent things and solve problems and then take them to the world without going through my heart. And Roberto Rigobon highlighted that for me in a way that became tangible. And it was the intersection of every product that we make and we're in this capitalist system and we're making these products and we're making money, but yet at the same time, we want to do good with that, right? And so how do you become part of that system that feeds your soul, that feeds your purpose? And I used to say jokingly, I don't wanna be in finance, right? Finance doesn't have a product, the money's product. I don't want money to be my product. I want to build things. I want to build amazing things. And I realized that that is the system that we're in and I need to understand that system. And I can have an impact in that system through the products I build, but also through my counsel or through my advice or through my next company. And that's when I had the idea to start my next company um, to help bring equity and equality through data. So um, it was a very pivotal moment for me. Um, and, and I think you will find many of those moments where you have the intersection of these seemingly disconnected topics that ultimately are part of this complex system that we're in. Rachel, you're really highlighting something that, you know, that I, I think inspires me on a regular basis is, you know, um, I think it, it should be such, right. It's such a standout, right. This, uh, the purpose that you have in your career and, um, the next step right? The next step after the EMBA is not necessarily, it might be a step up in the corporate ladder. And that's amazing too. And you can do really great things by having a, a larger role too. Um, but as people are making the decision about what that next step is, I see you all, right? I see our alumni just constantly and students constantly thinking about the why behind it as well, um, behind each of those next steps. So I, I really love to hear that coming out. Um, and for people listening to here, because I think it's a big part of our culture and community as well. Um, I see a couple, I think it, we're, we'll wrap up pretty soon, but I see a couple of questions about collaboration. There's one from an engineer who's, you know, asking from the perspective of engineers liking to, you know, do things themselves and, and how do you kind of move from, um, you know, from, from that individual mindset to more of a collaborative mindset. And then others asking about 
what the collaboration between classmates is like on a regular basis when you're also juggling family and uh, and your own coursework and, and full-time jobs as well. Um, and so uh, I think probably any of you can talk about this a little bit, but who's inspired? Can I jump in on the, yeah, I'm gonna take that odd opportunity with the like work, life, school, and how do you make all this stuff work? Um, I So when Jeff Bezos was still the CEO of Amazon, he would talk about like work-life balance isn't really a thing. You should try to seek like work-life integration. So here, here's how I tried to do it. Just about every weekend uh, that I came home from MIT, I came home with hoodies and hats and socks mm -hmm. and stuff from the bookstore. And I had things for my kids to, you know, the kids get to wear their MIT hoodie to school, right? And then a friend or a teacher at school is like, MIT, do you know someone that goes to MIT? And they're like, yeah, my dad goes to MIT. And then that, that teacher is like, oh, wow, your dad goes to MIT. He must be smart. That must mean you're smart, right? And so my kids got to feel the pride of MIT too. This wasn't like me being selfish and doing this for myself. I'm like, sorry, kids, I'm not going to the soccer game this weekend. Too bad. We got the whole family got involved, right? And the whole family got to be proud for themselves. And there are three really important weeks. Uh, there's significant other weekend, there's family weekend, and there's bring your boss to work, bring your boss to class, I don't know, <laughs> right? Bring your boss to campus. Um, yeah, bring your boss to campus weekend. Uh, so yeah, man, uh, significant other weekend. My wife got to come and she made friends with other significant others and they had great programming and she learned things and it was awesome, right? And bring your family. Like I brought my family, I brought my kids, I brought my parents, my in-laws, the whole thing. They all came and they got to wander around MIT and they got to go to classes and hang, and talk to professors and like then and bring your boss to campus week and like bring your boss, man. Even if, you know, whether your boss is paying for the program or not, but your boss gets to go back home after the weekend and like, well, what did you do with your weekend? Like, oh, I went to MIT and I hung out with this professor and I asked him questions. Like they, everybody gets to be proud and everybody gets to have a piece of this with you, right? And so I think just that integration, it, it worked out. I loved it. My kids love it. That's awesome, Daniel. Yeah, I can touch real quick on the collaboration piece. Uh, so as you know, in order to do incredible things, you're going to need to be able to work as a as a team. So a lot of the assignments are with a study group. So you have about a group of three or four that you work with to do assignments. So it's not all doing them individually. There are some assignments where you do have to do them on your own. But um, I'd say, you know, about a little bit more than half of the assignments that you have are actually group work. So it's not all on you. It's about, you know, how it is that you work with the team and how you together work efficiently to deliver, um, you know, a great product. That's really, thanks. Thanks, Ryan, for catching that part of the question too. I think, you know, as we, as we think about wrapping up for anybody who's listening, who's thinking about applying or, um, or who's in the middle of, of that process, I know there are such amazing questions in the chat. I know we won't be able to answer each one of them individually out loud. And so I wonder from from those from the three of you, is there anything that reflecting back on where you were a couple of years ago and, and thinking through the process, um, what you wish you knew or the most important, you know, the most important piece of information that you that you learned about an EMBA or something that surprised you once you um, once you joined the program. Um, that might be helpful for someone earlier in the journey. I saw a question, uh, you know, what is the thing that helps you stand out? And I, so uh, Mick and I have a classmate, classmate named Igor, and Igor and I met uh, on preview weekend. We were here on campus in a class, and uh, I don't know how much to tell this story. Whatever, I'm telling it. Uh, I think there was some applicants that were that were trying to 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 be they were trying to stand out, right? And they were trying to take opportunities to, you know, interject how amazing they were. And I well, those people weren't in our class. Uh, and one of the very very first weekend, you know, the we, the professors are just really kind of amazing human beings. I really and and. A professor says, like, you know, humility, I mean, 
in, in, in polite terms here, he's like, humility is a really important thing. Like on this campus, you are going to run into somebody that you know, you might think you're the expert at a thing, but you're going to run into someone that did, can just run circles around you, right? So I think humility and eagerness to learn and this, but this ties back into the mission, right? If we are mission driven, if we're trying to make the world better, I'm not trying to make me better. And I'm not trying to prove how much better I am than you, right? We're, we're here to work together. Thanks. I think that's a really, really helpful, really helpful perspective. For Ryan and Rachel, what do you, what do you wish you had been asked tonight or, or what would you say to yourself when you were nervously applying? Yeah, uh, you know, um, there's a there's a couple of things that um, I would say. So one, when you're thinking about your um, letter of, of recommendation, just really make sure you have someone that can speak to your contributions and that understands you as a person. Right. Don't um, try to go for someone that's got the, you know, the highest title um, or anything like that. You should make sure you you work with uh someone that actually understands you. That's one one piece of advice that I give. Um, the other thing that I actually wish I did, um, you know, I, I would say, yeah, before you even apply, but I think after you, you, you definitely do this step, you're gonna be running to apply. I wish I had looked more into things outside of the IMBA program. I had no clue until after I ended up getting into MIT, how many resources there were that were incredible. And I'm talking about world-class. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had mapped some of this stuff out a little bit better before I even applied. So that way I, I had an even clearer understanding because I looked through during the application process around you know what we have for the EMBA program, the different courses, but I did not look deep enough to see what else was on campus like you know i knew about like the c cell lab and all that other stuff because i have a computer science background um but then looking at the martin trust center and then mit delta v right mit fuse which is what i'm doing right now um and all these other initiatives and other speakers that come around to talk at mit you're going to be like wow um definitely made the right decision but now i need to make sure i carve out the time to take advantage of all these opportunities so that is probably the the main thing that i would share is make sure you look deeply at what it is that mit has to offer because it's incredible and as mike mentioned earlier you know you're an executive uh mba student but you are an mit student so you do have access to the full breadth of resources at mit and it's you know it's amazing so Ryan, I would tell you, you're feeling something that is very real, but that doesn't go away. You have access to MIT for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like there is not a single person affiliated with MIT that I feel like if I sent an email, they would not give me a phone call. I go to classes all the time. I'm on campus all the time. Now I'm local. So I ended up, I moved here. Um, but no matter, I know people who come in and go stuff. So you're not going to lose it. <laughs> Like when you graduate in May, you still have it. I promise. It is a lifelong community, and it is something that is very, very unique. Um, I think Sarah, my the thing that I wish I knew, um, something that I that I took a little bit for granted, um, how hard it was going to be. Um, and I say that because so when I was in the program, I was living in Seattle. Um, family I had two young children. Had two young children at the time. They're not as young now. Um, coming back and forth, pandemic hit the whole thing. Um, so I think my experience was a little bit unique because MIT did an amazing job. We still came on campus. We just had to quarantine a significant amount and we had the latest and greatest testing and everything. So it was actually a really fascinating um, experience to be on the cusp of all of that, um, right at the heart of where it was being developed. Um, so the travel aside, the program is very, very intense um, and it's intended to be that way. Um, it is MIT. And so um, if, you, if you're nervous about that, that's a good thing. I have a belief in life that you want to be about 70% nervous about everything, right? You never want to get comfortable because when you're comfortable, I'm sitting still um, and I have way too much to do in this one life. I have to sit still. Um, but it's actually quite intense. It's intense from an academic perspective, 
Um, and as you start researching and see the application, you'll understand that it is, it is a science-based, data analytics-based, heavy math program. Um, and that's where the, that magic combines, right? A lot of people who went to the program who they had to take calculus um, you know, to get into the program, um, you're like, I'm never gonna use this. You figure out how you're using calculus in this program, <laughs> I think for sure. And so it is hard. And at the same time, it gives you a space, a safe space to become the character and the human that you want to be. It is personally a journey. Um, part of every course, even data analytics, even system dynamics, there is this human component of developing your own leadership. Um, and that's heavy. Um, you can make it what you want, um, but that's why you're there. And so I encourage you to think about how it's going to be probably the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, but on the other side of that is one of the most amazing transformations um, and it's a continual transformation, as I mentioned, like you still have these moments. Um, you can't, you can't get that anywhere else. Um, you really can't. And so it's a classic example of you get out what you put in um, and to have the potential and opportunity to go through this program. Um, wow. Like it's really hard to put into words. So um, I just kind of leave with, I, I did not realize how transformational it would be. Um, even hoping that's what it would be. So well, gosh, I can't, I can't top, I can't top that you have closed off on such, on such a perfect note for anybody who's listening today. So Rachel, really, thank you so much, Daniel and Mick. Thank you for joining us. And, and Ryan, um, really appreciate you giving your, your personal experience to people who are joining us. Um, and for, you know, for those of you that are, that are joining us, there are, our application is is open. So if you haven't yet looked at it and you're thinking about applying this year, you can open it up now and take a look. But we do have rounds each month. So um, you can, it's still today's the ninth. It's possible to submit by our next round, which is this Thursday, um, Thursday for round one um, or or one of the rounds month to month. My best advice for someone who's already thinking about it and who has most of your ducks in the row is to shoot for uh, shoot for those rounds by April. Um, and if you're looking to learn more before, before you get to that point, we have a number of events coming up. A lot are virtual. Uh, the three that you see in Texas are going to be in person. So I'll be in Dallas on January 16th, Austin on January 17th, and Houston on January 18th. And if you're in the, if you live in Texas, I look forward to seeing you in person there. Uh, but we have a number of online events also, also coming up. So you can find these on, on our website as well. Really, truly, thanks for taking your evening and spending it with us. And I hope that we'll hear from a lot of you really soon. All right. Have a good night. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Hi, Mike. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Mick. <laughs> hey, Mick. Good to see you. <laughs>